Hey everyone. To find orcas in Norway is not an easy job. They are elusive and they are migrating all the time. And if you want to find a top predator, such as orca, you must find the food. So the, what we know is that in wintertime, the herrings, they come inside the fjord system and they stay from October to January in this deep fjord. The herrings is a very interesting species. To understand the migration pattern, actually we have to understand the whole food chain. And we call that also the trophic chain. The trophic chain in the North Atlantic is made of five levels. The base of this food chain is made of diatoms, dinoflagellate, and cyanobacteria. We call that the phytoplankton, the microalgae. The second level, it's very small animals uh, belonging to the family of copepods, and we call that the zooplankton. There are bigger copepods, which are the third level, and we know this species as krill. The fourth level is the herring. The one who is interesting us is the cuplea arangus, the Norwegian spring spawning herring. The level above is the apex predator, the orcas. Five level, it's a quite short food chain, and you understand easily that the phenomena has a direct and visible effect on the orcas. Something interesting about this herring is, first, the way. It's one pound per fish. It's a pretty small fish, but the lifespan is about 25 years. They live a pretty long life. And the spawning biomass has a year migration pattern in three places. The first place is the spawning. The herrings, adult herrings, they are spawning alongside the Norwegian coast mainly in the south, but some spots are observed in the north. Then the larvae, they migrate with the Gulf Stream up to the Barents Sea, where they stay four years. And the adults, after spawning, they go in the open sea, they spread out in the open sea to eat the whole summer the krill. They go in October inside the fjord system for the overwintering. This is the place they wait until the spring, until January, February, where they migrate to the spawning place. After feeding on krill the whole summer after the feeding ground, the herrings are made of 20% fat in the body. It's a very fat fish, and this is the reason why the orcas are crazy on herrings. Because it's an easy prey, it's a safe prey, and it provides a lot of energy. After they spawn, the herrings, they go back to 2% fat in the body, which is normal for this fish. The Norwegian spring spawning herring is one of the most valuable stockfish in the world. We are speaking about $1 billion per year, just for the direct catch. And this is the reason why they have been overfished. The estimated stock before this uh, fish industry catch everything was about 16 millions of tons. We are speaking about millions of tons. And then, year after year, the Russians, Icelanders, Norwegians, Ferrans, they were fishing the herrings without any regulation. And this stock has depleted down to 50,000 tons. The species almost collapsed at that time. And of course, the fishermen, they were pointing the orcas because they could see the orcas chasing the herring stock. And they were upset. And they started to shoot orcas because they thought they were responsible. It took a while before the Norwegian government understand that that was not the orcas but that was the overfishing responsible. So they decided a moratorium for 20 years, no more fishing. After 20 years, when the stock rebuilt over 5 million tons, they decided to start again the fishing with a quota. And the quota is about 10%. In the 50, 60, and 70, it was the golden age of overfishing, and the stock of herrings was uh, split in two parts. One of the parts was located in the north of Norway with the feeding grounds, the wintering grounds, and the spawning ground. Another part of the stock was located at the east uh, coast of the Iceland, but they migrated in the Norwegian coast for spawning. Between 71 and 87, it was the moratorium time, and the herring stock 
was almost depleted and it was two wintering places. One was in the Lofoten Island in a place called the Tisfjord. The second one was in the south. The spawning occurred alongside the Norwegian coast and the feeding ground was really close to the Norwegian coast also. Between 95 and 2000, only one spawning area occurred in the west side of uh, Vesteroland. It's a Lofoten area also. And that was the situation I knew when I started the Orca expedition. Um, that's why we were going in the Tisfjord. Between 2008 and 2011, all the company, all the operators, they stopped the activities of whale watching inside the Tisfjord. It was no more orcas. But when the herrings migrated from the wintering place to the spawning ground in the south, they were following the Norwegian coast. And it was a lot of orcas pretty close to the, to the coastline. Almost every week we could keep contact one day or two days with the orcas, with this population of orcas. In 2012, we had this information from fishermen that a new area popped up for the winter and the first time we enter in this field called Kalfjord, we could observe hundreds of orcas. But the new phenomena was the humpback whale. And we could uh, observe that the humpback whale and the orcas, they were chasing the herrings. That was totally new to see the humpback chasing the herring. We thought, we thought before that they were eating only the krill. And then we observed they were eating the herrings. In 2017, no more herrings enter inside the Kalfjord and all the activity moved again. It seems that a part of the herrings are wintering more and more north every year, but there is a second part of the stock which is wintering in open sea, close to the feeding ground. The herrings, they have shown us that they can move very fast and decide very fast the changement in the wintering ground. The future will tell us we are ready to change. We just have to understand and to plan the herrings, they are a thick layer of herrings at the bottom line. The herrings, they are moving up to the surface at nighttime and they are going down when it's a daytime. And in daytime, the orcas, they will dive and they will isolate the bait ball of herring and they will push the bait ball of herrings up to the surface. And for that, they will show the white belly, they will surround the bait ball and turning around like a carousel. They will emit some sounds, some specific frequencies to push the herring up to the surface. And the surface is the place where the herrings will be trapped. And the, the orcas, they will keep the pressure on the bait ball. And meanwhile, they will eat the herrings with what we call the tail slapping. They will swim towards the bait ball. They will tail slap the edge of the bait ball. And they will, so they will kill with the powerful tail slap tens and tens of herrings. And they will turn upside down and will eat the herrings this is a very long process because they are eating the herrings one by one. There is no competition between orcas. There is no rush for the food. They think in terms of a group because they know that if they steal the food to another one, uh, they can push this one to starve to death. And every member of the family is important for the hunt. So that's why they are sharing the food, basically. They are really social. So they eat the herrings one by one and it's a long process. This is the reason why also we find, mainly find big males in the carousel feeding. Because um, the young and the female, they eat what they need and they go immediately for playing, for resting, while the big males are still eating because they need a lot of herrings. And actually they are eating the herrings. And I will ask you to look clearly uh, this footage. You're gonna see the orca male eating one herring and you will see the mouth will move like if he's chewing the herring. Actually, he, he does. And there is something going outside this mouth. He's spitting something. He will just chew the herring and he will spit the head, the bone and the belly, just eating the meat and the eggs. So this is why also it's a long process. But the rest of the year, there is no reason to follow the herrings in open sea when they are back to 2% fat in the body and spread out. It's gonna be hundreds of kilometers for just one herring. So they stay alongside the Norwegian coast and they have been observed in the predation on other species of a fish, such as mackerel, such as salmon. So they are targeting the fat fish. And they have also been observed chasing small birds. But the same orcas we are diving with have been observed to uh, hunt the seals also in the seal colony. They have been also observed to eat the harbor porpoises 
and some attack tribes has been spotted in uh, Andenes, in north of Andenes. And actually they are starving because uh, we are taking all the food from the sea. So there is not a lot of uh, food uh, left in the sea. So it's a hard time for orcas. That's why they are also uh, really crazy on herrings in winter time. They have to make fat for the rest of the year. And when we observe the orcas at the beginning of the season, when they start to eat the herrings, uh, they are skinny actually. It means that they have used the fat layer uh, the whole winter. Since the herrings are migrating inside the kalf fjord, a new top predator invited himself in, in this activity, and it's the humpback whale. We have seen the orcas and the humpback chasing the same bait bull of herrings the first year, and we thought at that moment that they were cooperating uh, together to hunt the herrings. And um, that was a little bit idealistic, because when I dived the first time inside a feeding, uh, what I could observe was not a cooperation, it was a rough competition. Because the humpback whale, uh, they have a totally different hunting strategy. Actually, they wait until the orcas push the bait ball at the surface, and when they can target the bait ball at the surface from below, they just rush through the bait ball and they open the mouth, and they grab everything, and they can ruin hours of works of orcas in the split of a second. And the orcas, they just turn around the, the humpbacks and they I could feel that they were totally lost and they didn't know what to do. And actually it had an impact on the social structure instead of staying all the time in a tide group and swimming and eating and playing in the tide group, actually they spread out and they were eating around the humpback whale. Um, I guess it was a hard time at that moment. But what we could observe after two, three years, it's a new kind of carousel feeding. And I called that the rush feeding. The first time I was uh, observing this, it was from the boat, and um, it was a different carousel feeding. Uh, instead of keeping static the bait ball at the surface, um, the orcas, they were surrounding the bait ball and pushing the bait ball at the surface like shepherds. And I was wondering, why are they doing that? There must be a reason, because it's totally new. And. Uh, I understood the first time I was in the water in the middle of this new rush feeding. When they push the bait ball at the surface, the humpback whale, instead of attacking the bait ball just from below, had to attack from the side because the bait ball is moving. And that makes the humpback miss the attack. So the orcas, they can keep control on the bait ball. This is the rush feeding and it's the proof of the uh, adaptability of orcas and they can solve problems, complex problems such as this one, um, immediately. And what is remarkable is that uh, they solve problems all together and they decide all together what to do and they do it. Last year we had also a changement in this rush feeding. I call that the rush feeding 2.0. They put the pressure on the bait ball from the top and they keep the bait ball down to about 15 meters. Uh, we could see that because it was no more birds activity. Actually, the birds activity was totally spread out because it was no more food coming up to the surface. It's too deep for the seagulls to, to catch something. And um, we could dive on it. Um, I have no speaking picture uh, of this 2.0, it's only observation, 2.0 uh, rush feeding. But um, I wonder if it's um, to uh, confuse again the humpback whale or if it is to avoid the whale watching boat because then we cannot spot the center, the epicenter of the action with the birds. So um, we are still wondering, we are still learning from orcas and they are still um, evolving their hunting strategy. So this evolution in the hunting strategy proves us that the orcas are really clever and they can invent or e make the hunting strategy evolve in the time, depending on the situation and uh, finding solution on the problem they encounter. So that was Orcas in Norway's diet and behavior. Thank you for watching, thank you for your attention. All your experience, all your footage, all your pictures of interaction uh, are helpful. You can contribute and become contributors of our Facebook page called UC Orc Sans Frontières. You can ask for being a UC ambassador and it's gonna be a great honor for us to include you in our staff of ambassadors. If you organize some events, seminars, workshops, works about the orca behavior or also the uh, how to come close with orcas, we're going to be uh, really happy to take part of it or any other suggestion you may have. See you in the next video, which will be 
orcas worldwide predators. After speaking about this specific population of orcas in Norway, we're going to explore other parts in the world, how the orcas are hunting and what they are hunting. Bye bye everyone.